Um, we're going to get started here with a <clears throat> presentation from Allison Gill. Allison is the Vice President for Legal and Policy here at American Atheists. Um, she is an incredible asset to the organization and brings with her years, decade of experience on civil rights issues, on data collection, on the importance of data, um, and the importance of having good information when we're talking about advocacy. Um, she is a nationally recognized expert on our area of policy, but also on LGBT law, on equality, on civil rights, on religious exemptions, and is somebody who any of our partners will know um, is just a tremendous advocate um, and, and a fantastic resource uh, to build power here in our community, uh, to train our, uh, our activists and our folks on the ground and give them the resources they need to be successful in, in changing policies for the better in their communities and nationwide. Um, so with that, I am incredibly pleased and uh, grateful to introduce Allison Gill. Allison, you can pop back in here. There you are. Hi. Great. Hi. Thank you for such a glowing, a glowing uh, intro. I appreciate it. <laughs> I have I have many more positive things I could say, but we would eat up your entire speaking slot. So we'll just let right. you get into it. So I'll 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 duck away and and let let you speak for yourself. All right. Well, thank you, and I'm really excited to have a chance to share my musings on movement policy with you all. So I want to start off with a quote by Saul Alinsky which is that tactics means doing what you can with what you have. And so in order for us to discuss tactics realistically and meaningfully, we have to have a realistic picture about where we stand as a movement and what we have. And so I apologize if this at first might seem like a bit of a, it may seem frustrating or a bit of a downer, but this is how we ground ourselves and push forward for change. And of course, atheists like to deal in reality. And with that in mind, I'll try to discuss reality and then hopefully provide a hopeful way forward. So I'll start with where are we currently? Well, one question that I've been thinking about a lot recently is at what point do we stop saying that they are our opponents, are eroding the wall of separation between religion and government, and instead say that the wall has crumbled and that it needs to be rebuilt? At what point do we recognize that religious groups, especially conservative Christian ones, have rights and privileges that are favored over everyone else in society? I believe that we are certainly approaching that point, and depending on how the Supreme Court rules in the coming weeks, in the Fulton case, for example, we may have passed it. And so just to give some background, let's talk about some of the recent events in the past few years. Last year, Congress and the Trump administration Gave, did the biggest giveaway in American history of taxpayer dollars to religious organizations for religious purposes. So that's important, for religious purposes. More than $7 billion went to churches, and that's not even counting the later rounds of the Paycheck Protection Program, and more than $4 billion for religious schools. And really sadly, this went unchallenged even by our allies in Congress. So this went forward, it was not challenged in the courts, and it was not challenged in Congress. Uh, recent Supreme Court rulings have shown that the court is radically changing longstanding law on religious liberty without doing so explicitly or in a way that provides logic or guidance. For example, over the last several years, the Supreme Court has declared that businesses can have religious rights that must be protected, that a 40-foot tall Latin cross on public land is somehow not a religious symbol, that somehow religious schools are not intrinsically religious when it comes to state funding, so that they, they may, they must be funded along with other private schools. However, when it comes to um, protections and employment for teachers, they are intrinsically religious and therefore those should be thrown out in the name of religious freedom. That religious groups um, must be included in any grant program and they cannot be denied any benefit given to other groups, even to protect the separation of religion and government. That churches cannot be subject to public health restrictions aimed at stopping the spread of disease if any secular organizations are not, are not restricted, even if they are not at all similar. Like for example, the way I think about this sometimes is if hospitals are able to be open, then churches must be open. So we've seen a lot of laws like that. That a policymaker speaking even in minor negative ways about religion may be caused to overturn their decisions or governmental actions, basically shutting down the free speech of lawmakers and policymakers to criticize religion. 
And now they are on the verge of potentially overturning the decision that allows the government to act neutrally, even if it burdens religious exercise, meaning that um, there would be an implicit religious exemption to every governmental action. So that's not guaranteed, but that's a, certainly a possibility that we could see in the coming weeks as a result of the Fulton decision. And it's not just the Supreme Court either. The lower courts have also been packed with young ideological judges uh, by, by the Trump administration. The states are being flooded with Christian nationalist legislation uh, one wave after another. First, it was Project Blitz. Then uh, the huge wave of anti-abortion bills that we saw after um, Kavanaugh and um, Barrett were added to Justices Kavanaugh and Barrett were added to the Supreme Court. This year, we're seeing bills to exempt religious organizations from COVID public health restrictions and to attack trans youth in the name of religion. And many of these bills are passing with broad bipartisan support. And finally, you know, there's a whole slew of policies from the Trump administration that expand religious exemptions, that funnel money to religious organizations, that allow discrimination um, on the basis of religious belief or otherwise. And these are many, most of them are still in place and they have not yet been removed. And that, of course, will take years if it happens at all in some areas. There is so much gain there that I'm not sure it will all eventually all go back. So when it comes to religious equality and the separation of religion and government, we are in a dark place, perhaps one of the darkest in our history. Frankly, it would be folly for American atheists and other secular groups to continue business as usual in this environment. We need new strategies and tactics, new insights, and to rebuild our secular movement to meet our current needs. And sadly, the broader American public is only just beginning to understand the consequences of allowing the wall of separation to atrophy and allowing the religious fanatics to amass so much power. So how do we move forward from here? Well, fortunately, this situation presents us with many new possibilities, including the possibility for renewal of our movement. First, we need a more cohesive secular movement and a secular identity. One of the things plaguing our movement from nearly the very beginning is division and sort of one true wayism. The fact is atheists and non-religious people are a minority and one that is vilified by our opponents and misunderstood or ignored by most Americans. Few people understand or even care about the challenges that atheists face in our country. And one of the ways American Atheists has worked to address this is um, to build a sense of community is through the U.S. Secular Survey, which is the largest ever survey focusing on the experiences of atheists and non-religious people. 34,000 uh, of you and other non-religious non people across the country participated in the survey and really made it possible. Um, and this report helps us to know about ourselves as a community and gives us a chance to also educate others about atheists and non-religious people. For example, after this report, we have a more accurate idea about what sorts of discrimination that non-religious people face, where it happens, and how it affects their lives. Uh, you know, too often the stigmatization of non-religious people is dismissed as not real, even among our community. I remember when we were, um, trying to set up the survey and we were getting feedback from the community, we got many emails uh, saying, you know, this is not a real problem. Non-religious people don't face discrimination. Non-religious youth are never rejected or ejected from their, from their families' homes. Um, no one is fired because of they are atheists. That's all very, very false. Uh, it absolutely all happens. And it's actually pretty rampant across the country, especially, especially in very religious areas. So I think, atheists and non religious people have a very different experience of what that what their lives are like as atheists depending on where they live in the country and that's not even fully understood even amongst their own community um we in the earlier panel chrissy stroop and Catherine stewart discussed the importance of stories well that's another benefit of the secular survey um there, there were nearly ten thousand people that provided further information and stories about their lives and that information will be invaluable. There is a good amount of it included in the report on the secular survey, and we'll also be using more of that over time. Um, there are another of other benefits to the survey as well. It's useful for advocacy purposes, for getting program funding for our community uh, from foundations and the government, for shaping programs so that they actually pertain to the needs of our community, like for example, anti-bullying programs. 
Um, in order for the movement to be sustainable in the long term, this type of work is really essential. And if you haven't seen the results of the US Secular Survey yet, please do check it out at secularsurvey.org. There is the survey report itself called Reality Check and the first mini population brief called the Tipping Point Generation focusing on 18 to 24 year old participants. And we're going to be producing several others. Um, the survey was also emblematic of the way that we have built relationships with other secular movement organizations. We as a secular movement have never been so unified are willing and able to work together for our mutual goals, which is absolutely essential given how well-funded and powerful our opponents are. So second, we need new political strategies. Um, for example, you may have seen the discussion earlier about getting atheists into office. Critical, absolutely critical. There have been also terrific efforts to increase representation at the federal level, such as the creation of the Congressional Free Thought Caucus, and of course, uh, Congressman Jared Huffman spoke yesterday, and you saw the video from uh, Congressman Jamie, Jamie Raskin this morning. So uh, that has been a really important effort to move forward. And American atheists, instead of continuing just to focus on federal issues, we have changed our strategy over the last several years to really um, focus on the states. So they're much closer to the people. State, state law actually has a much bigger impact on most people's lives than federal law. And by working on state level law, it gives us an opportunity to more closely work with and mobilize local atheist groups and activists across our country. We can make a much more significant difference by stopping negative bills at the local level and getting people engaged um, and, you know, actually pass bills. It's, it's much easier to pass bills at the state level than it is to work on bills, for example, for 10 years or more at the federal level and maybe never see movement. And we can't just work on stopping negative bills. Um, we have to, or hold on to the law and agenda of 50 years ago. We have to advance a positive agenda that progresses the goals of the secular movement. For example, last year, American Atheists issued a model policy guide with several example bills to state lawmakers uh, that they can introduce and improve access to the courts um, so people can enforce their constitutional rights to ensure that religious exemptions and denials of medical care based on religion do not harm others. And now we've seen those bills be picked up and introduced not just by us, but by our partner organizations in different states. So now we can coordinate with them and those lawmakers who we might not have even had a connection with previously to move forward and advance the laws to meet the goals of the secular movement. And it's very different from federal level work, fortunately. It's also essential that the secular movement build its political power by increasing its ties to other civil rights movements. So American Atheists has done this by supporting uh, federal bills like the Equality Act, where there are mutual goals and working with coalition partners on matters of state and federal policy, especially right now, uh, when religion is so clearly being weaponized to harm their interests, our perspectives and insights on these issues are really core and valuable for our partners. So it gives us a better chance to build relationships that will last for the long term. Third, we need new legal strategies. For too long, the secular movement has simply focused on hanging on to the victories it won 50 years ago. When was the last time the movement had a significant legal victory that actually changed the law in a positive way for example, at the Supreme Court. I was thinking back about this as I was you know, preparing for this. And I think the answer is probably the uh, Christian Legal Society v. Martinez case in 2010. Well, I don't, I'm not sure if um, you folks are, are familiar with that case, but we'll, I should mention that one of the, I'll get to this in a moment, but you know, one of the major things that the Trump administration did is issue new rules that basically undermine the heart of that case by requiring public universities to privilege um, religious student groups. So uh, even that has sort of been attacked recently. Um, it's simply a fact that our traditional establishment clause arguments will not work in the increasingly ideological courts of today. And so we need to adapt. And one of the ways that American Atheist is doing that is by taking a page from the right wing um, and relying on free speech arguments to advance their goals and, and ends. Uh, for example, religious activists have used, or I should say really misused, uh, free speech arguments to attack non-discrimination laws, to attack union rights, 
and to allow rampant corruption in our political system. Obviously, we don't want that. At the same time, we can follow their their lead and use um, religious free. I'm sorry, free speech arguments to bolster religious freedom and to push back on religious coercion. For example, um, we've brought a number of cases, sort of flipping the narrative, using free speech to protect the rights of atheists. In Arkansas, we sued State Senator Jason Rapert for attacking free speech of his atheist constituents by barring them from online public forums on social media um, that he manages as a government official. So we have a government official purposely excluding atheists because of their beliefs. And you know that would be actually be fairly challenging to sue under the establishment cause, but we're able to challenge it by using these new methods. Um, in an amicus brief to the Supreme Court for the Fulton case, we argued that the using the statements um, one of the ad, uh, op opposition's arguments is that the, the statements of government officials should be used as examples of anti-religious animus and then used to sort of invalidate laws and policies. And we argue that that would be if they were to take their statements about religion and use that to invalidate laws and policies, that would be uh, that would violate free speech principles. If any criticism of religion is an excuse to invalidate a law, basically it creates a de facto blasphemy law. And so that can't be allowed to stand. Uh, we sued the government, I'm sorry, the Department of Education to overturn a Trump rule that I mentioned a moment ago that favored the free speech of religious groups on college campuses above everybody else by requiring, school, requiring the schools to fund them, even if they break the rules and grant them exemptions from rules around non-discrimination, for example. So again, we are able to sort of make uh, arguments based on free speech um, to, to push back on religious privilege. And anywhere that atheists are silenced or compelled to speak in support of our system that privileges religion, there's opportunity for us and other, to use uh, free speech and other key constitutional principles to bolster our religious freedom arguments and in you know, different ways. Finally, we need to increase the appeal of the secular movement, adapting our messages to meet the needs and times and reach new audiences uh, interested in our issues. The good news here is that our opponents are already doing much of the work for us. The Christian nationalists, um, their policies, they're overreaching in ways that harm actual people in their daily lives, their vilification of atheists and religious minorities, um, and their clear desperation to indoctrinate children are rapidly driving people away. The real mask really is off on Christian nationalism, especially after January 6th. And they're, and they're less popular now than ever before. At the same time, year after year, more people are identifying as religiously unaffiliated or explicitly non-religious than ever before. And just during the Trump years, for example, um, the percentage of religiously affiliated Americans fell from 55% to 47%. The first time it was less than a majority. So that's an incredible change in just four years. So we must find new ways to communicate our message to these folks and engage with them on issues they feel are important. Um, this is especially true for young people who are essential to the vitality of our movement and you know, growing moving forward. Talking about constitutional fidelity to separationism just for some reason isn't as compelling to young activists as it used to be. Instead, we have to show how lack of religious equality harms them personally, undermines pluralism and religious freedom for everybody and damages their society more broadly. This is one of the reasons we surveyed the community to find out what matters to non-religious people and also why we partner with other groups to express, to, sorry, to address issues that matter to our constituents. And to give you just one example, climate change. So before the US Secular Survey, I, um, I had never really considered climate change to be a secular issue. I, I never thought of it that way. But the survey really showed that it was one of the top issues that participants not only thought was really important, but that they thought was critical for secular organizations to address. For, and for youth, for a, youth ages 18 to 24, it was in the top three issues. So that was not only important, and they thought we should address it, but it was one of the top three issues uh, alongside secular, maintaining secular public schools. So really, really a key issue. And upon reflection, I can see how many of the arguments used to stop us from addressing climate change in, in our society are rooted in religious belief. 
for example, such as that God would never allow another flood, right? Um, the teaching from the, um, uh, the, the Noah's Ark story, or that God entrusted earth to mankind to do whatever they want with, or that a second coming will be happening soon anyway, so we don't need to worry about climate change. And there's plenty of other justifications, but those are at least some that are used, right? So this just goes to show, I don't think we have all the answers yet, but we must be open to rethinking about what are secular issues and how we talk about them and what's important to the communities, especially the communities we want to grow and reach out to. And with that, I really want to thank everyone for listening to my my musings on movement strategy and to see maybe if Sam, if we have any questions from the audience that we can take, I think we have what five minutes. Hi there. Hi. So we have a question that is, how can we leverage this unique moment when in person church attendance, it says is at an artificial low. Yes, that we can keep them from giving their time, money and effort to churches once they reopen. I think there will be some level of natural fallout. I do. Um, just because people will realize for the last year that they did not need that in their lives and able to get by without it. Um, so I think there will already be some, it won't go back exactly to the level it used to be, uh, I think. But at the same time, I, I think that we have to show that there are other ways to form community. Um, you know, there was some discussion this morning about how and you know non-religious communities can sort of help people have sort of that space when they leave religion and you know we have so many great affiliates all across the country that are doing social activities doing volunteerism doing advocacy i really think that's critical and so we have to work with those groups and you know encourage all of you to sort of bounce back and be visible and be active especially as this pandemic is ending as people are building figuring out what to do next with their lives and their time and as they leave these um these these uh you know confi the confinement really and so that could be like you know public events that you could do at the library it could be all sorts of ways but just be visible i think being really visible over the next six months i think will make a huge difference to give people alternatives luckily we have a panel coming up on that next so great that's good timing <laughs> <laughs> thanks for the plug yeah. <laughs> uh let's see there's another question here it says are there any any states i know the answer are there any states where things are particularly hopeful or dire in terms okay. of state legislation. Yes, I'm so glad you asked this. It's like a perfect uh, key in here. So we, every year, release a report called the state, state of the Secular States Report. And so this looks at uh, law and policy measures in all 50 states plus DC and Puerto Rico that affect religious equality and the separation of religion and government. And it's at atheist.org slash states. And so you can look at every state and see what laws and policies they have that are good and bad. Um, and so we also group them broadly into three categories. One that is very sort of, has a lot of protections for religious equality uh, and states like New Jersey, um, California, Washington, DC, they fall in that area. And then states that are sort of in the middle and then states that have a lot of religious exemptions like Mississippi and uh, other states in the South and a few in the mountainous West. So, um, Arkansas, for example. So that those are some of the, the differences. So I would point to, and especially this year, I think Arkansas has been the worst state. They're just passing every stupid law that comes in front of them, honestly. Um, they actually passed, I think, the, the broadest denial of care bill that's ever been existing in our country. So any medical provider can refuse to provide any service. And that medical provider, employer, insurer can refuse to provide any service um, based on their beliefs, which is absurd. So that's just to give you some examples. Thanks. Let's see. How do you deal with mentally entrenched religious judges? Ooh. Free thinkers in North Dakota fought for almost 20 years to remove 10 commandments from public property and religious judges just said it was okay. And so I I think that also ties into what we were talking about with SCOTUS. It does. Case. Yeah, some of that is coming from the Supreme Court, which is a longer term conversation. And uh, actually, that's a really great opportunity for me to plug a panel that we're having on the 21st being hosted by Amanda Kanif, uh, which will feature um, some really great partner organizations speaking about the courts and how we reform them. So that will we'll, we'll save for that conversation. However, I will say at the state level, 
in many, many states, not all, but many, many states, judges are elected. And so, you know, you know, you can campaign against judges, you can work to support good judges who will actually uphold the Constitution. Um, so you can educate people about people, the bad record of judges. So I, I don't know about North Dakota offhand, but that is something to keep in mind. And also that states have different law than federal law. So sometimes they're, they're, you know, they're able to make different decisions and they choose not to. So that's another thing to keep in mind. I think we have time for one more. Okay. And this is a good one, particularly for you to answer. Is there any truth to the statement that law school creates atheists? <laughs> hmm, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, they just managed to staff an administration full of lawyers who were religious zealots. So maybe not. Um, <laughs> but I, I think that there are a good number of lawyers that are atheists, but uh, I, I really can't say for sure. Um, yeah, it's interesting. There aren't a lot of, I guess, uh, AHA... Uh, did start a national humanist legal group, but they haven't had many activities recently, but there isn't a lot of space there. I mean, there's not a lot of people that are sort of active in the atheist lawyer space. So maybe that's something we need to look more into is how to better mobilize um, atheist and non-religious lawyers. Mm 